Again, it is good to be in Bible College this evening, and we do welcome you to class. This is the Revelation class. This is session three and lesson number eight, and we're going to look tonight at Revelation chapter number 22, and this will be our last lesson in the book of Revelation. And class, I want to thank you. I want to thank each one of you for your faithfulness. But even at that, I want to thank you for, for just being a good class. You have helped me. You've enriched me. You've, you've, uh, you don't know how this study, this time, has helped me. And I thank God I've been enriched by this class. And had it not been for you guys, I probably wouldn't have done the in-depth study and, and working as hard as, as I've worked. And still, I know very little of, about the book of Revelation. But I've learned this time, and I thank God for that. And I hope that you okay. have as well. And uh, but we're looking tonight, chapter number 22. Boy, it's going to be a beautiful place. Amen. I like waterfalls, don't you? Uh, just something about beautiful waterfalls. I don't know if there'll be any waterfalls in the new paradise. I don't know that. But uh, I like the idea of it. But I believe the lion and the lamb, I believe there'll be creation there. Uh, and, and I don't know that. But I just think that. Amen. Uh, but let's look. And we're going to begin tonight. And first of all, before we start, I want to thank those that are in Stanford, Nebraska. Again, Elijah and Josh, you keep up the good work out there. And then I want to, I want to just mention briefly tonight, Brother Craig Shue. He made the dean's list this semester. The prayer list. So, appreciate Brother Craig. Amen. And uh, Courtney, you'll pay me after service uh, $5 for that comment. Amen. All right, let's get into the lesson tonight. The new paradise, all right? Uh, let's get started this evening. The words, the last words of, of people often have great significance. And I believe that, oftentimes. Um, some of the last, famous last words of people. You ever think about this? There was a guy, a, a Yankee, a, a union. <laughs> a union. A Yankee soldier, amen. Amen during the Civil War, and he was talking about them, them rebels over there, and you know what he said? He said, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. Boom! <laughs> and he died, literally. That was his last words. General Thomas Stonewall Jackson, he was a rebel, a confederate. He said, let us cross over the river and sit in the shade of the trees. He was a very religious man. Stonewall used to love to, to, to fight on Sunday. He must have been a Baptist. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, you'll get that after a while. Uh, but I thought that interesting. Uh, Thomas Edison, he said these words. His last words was, it is very beautiful over there. I like that, don't you? I like that. My mom was holding my wife's hand when she, when she passed away. And I was out in the yard out here waiting for the ambulance to come and and uh, she was in and out, and, and uh, my wife told her last time she had consciousness, she said, Bessel, I love you. And my mom's last words on this side of eternity was, I love you too, darling. And she went out to meet Jesus. And I imagine the first thing that she said to him was, I just want to tell you I love you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Last words are important. Yeah. They are. They really are. Jesus' last words on the cross. Mm -hmm. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I like that, don't you? Last words are important. Mm -hmm. This chapter brings us to the end of God's revelation to, to man of the end time events. Mm -hmm. It gives us a glimpse, this chapter does, of, of God's new paradise. And actually, God had established paradise on earth for man in Genesis chapter 2, and man erred and messed it up by sin. We saw that it was lost to man in Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says in Genesis 3, 24, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So we saw it lost to man in Genesis 3. A paradise also was visited by Paul 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 4. The Bible says in that chapter how that he was caught up into what? Paradise. And heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Well, what were those words? Well, it wasn't lawful for them to be uttered. Amen? By a man. So, so no one knows what Paul heard. But Paul got some education. I'm going to tell you that. He saw some signs. By the way, let me just say this tonight. Whether or not you believe it's real or not, it's as real right. as the concrete under the tile that we're standing on tonight. Amen. It's just real. Amen? I know there's concrete under these tiles. How do you know, preacher? Because I was here when the cement was poured. And I know exactly. I was here the day they laid the tile. I can say beyond any doubt that there's cement under this tile. Directly under our feet. And I want to tell you, there's a paradise of God that's more sure than the concrete that's under the tile that I'm standing on tonight. Somebody should shout right there. Amen. Amen. It was visited by Paul. But it was promised in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, and as well as Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 7. In Luke 23, 43, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. What a deal. Amen. The thief was dying anyway, so why not go with Jesus? Amen. 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 Oh yeah. He looked over at him. He said, Lord, when you, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. What did Jesus do? He reached over and saved him right there on the cross. <laughs> he said, Today thou shalt be with me Amen. in paradise. Boy, I'm telling you, I'm looking forward to it. Aren't you? Yeah. Jesus said those words. Yeah. Do you believe Jesus lies? Yeah. Absolutely not. Revelation chapter number 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, you got an ear? He let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So this paradise is promised. And we can just bank on it. It's coming. Now in the final chapter, we have the final words, and we see it. It is paradise restored. Man is again in fellowship with God and will eternally be in His presence in that state. And that's hard for us to comprehend. It's hard for us to comprehend eternity. But one day we're going to be in His presence. How do you like that? I looked online everywhere I could look and all these pictures of what they said was paradise, I didn't care for. So I made my own. And I don't care much for that. But you know what? It's a crude representation, I believe, of the street plus the trees and then the river that comes down through it. And so, if you don't like the animation, you can talk to me after class and you'll fail this session. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in before you start complaining about that ugly picture up there. But you know what? It's just a representation. It's going to be beautiful over there. Can you imagine? Can you imagine pure gold? I started to make that yellow, but I thought, man... And the pure transparent gold is not going to be that. It's going to be so much more than just a yellow color. And so yellow is not the right color. It's going to be transparent. And we learned that last week. So now, God has actually restored the universe into a state where there is no sin. And that's something to think about. How many of you sin today? Don't raise your hand. Let, let just one person do it. No, 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 no. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> me I did I needed and multiple times I'm sure I needed to be in Winston and I needed to hurry and I needed to go to the cleaners and I needed to do the honeydew list <coughs> and, and I was running out of time Brother Rodney and I pulled out of here and almost barking tires, I was in such a rush. I got out here and slammed over here on the road, slammed around the first curve going that way. It's a good thing that you didn't meet me on the highway. I hadn't got anywhere, just around the curve, and got behind this other vehicle, and two old fellas in a little old pickup, and they was going 28 miles an hour. And we drove 28 miles an hour or less all the way over to 18. Time we got over to 18, you guessed it. <laughs> My patience had worn thin. Well. 
Can I get an amen? amen? Yeah. So, we all have sinned. But there's coming a day, Brother Kent, that's going to be put away. Yeah. Oh yeah, God has restored the universe into such a state that there'll be no more sin. All is peaceful. Everyone worships and serves God. There'll be no need for locks on the door. Think about that. No alarm systems. Hallelujah. You won't have to lock your car door. Car door? You don't need a car. We'll be going where we want to go. Amen? All is peaceful. Everybody's going to worship and serve the Lord. And now all the created beings know of God's wonderful attributes of love, His mercy. They know His kindness. They, they know of His wrath and His justice. And they know of His holiness. And I'm going to be honest with you. Everyone will be convinced of His righteousness. We're going to see Him as He is. In this place, Revelation chapter 22, verse number 1, there is a river of water of life. And He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb, or rather, out of, of the Lamb. Now, we know this world has a lot of water. But the world to come will have no seas. I was talking to a retired government worker just this last weekend. And uh, he's, a, he's an amazing man. He's a missionary. And uh, I won't tell you much about his name for we're recording this. But he worked for uh, one of the high places in government uh, in the Defense Department. And he actually helped develop a program to identify terrorists and establishing a database. And in our conversation, he said this to me. He said, Preacher, we have oceans that help separate us from the bad guys. And that's a good thing. Right. And you know what? We just had talked about how the seas separated nations. And that's very true. So the new world uh, could possibly have some of the features of the old world, but we know that it's not going to have oceans according to Scripture. Right. But I want to say this, there's going to be one exception. It may have some of the characteristics because God is a creator. And God, when He creates, He creates His own way. And by the way, I love the earth. Don't you love the world? Isn't right. there some beautiful sights to behold in God's creation? So I think that there'll be uh, some of the same attributes in the coming creation of perfection as there is in this earth except it will be perfected. And that's question number five. So understand that. The heavenly Jerusalem is said to have had a, a particular river flowing through it. And the river has the water of life in it. I don't know what that will be to drink that water, but it will be good. I'm looking forward to taking a drink, aren't you? Amen. The Garden of Eden had a river that flowed through it as well. In Genesis chapter number 2 and verse number 10, the Bible says, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. We know where the source of the river is. In the new paradise, it is the throne of God and of the Lamb. The water of life flows from God and from Christ, and they are the source of all life that lives in the city. It reminds me of the story of the woman of Samaria as she, come to the, as she came to the well and she found Jesus seated at the well. And you read that verse already. I hope you have. But in verse number 10, Jesus answered the woman, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it was saith to thee, to thee, give me to drink, thou would have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. See, that's the source of living water is the Christ Jesus. Uh, the woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing, hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. And whence hast thou, then hast thou this, that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob? And I'll say, yea, he was. Right, but, right. which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give in him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Can I tell you, 
I believe that water that comes out of the throne is both real, literal, and I believe it's also symbolism of eternal life. I think it's two things. I really do. By the way, there will be no life there, no person there, other than those who have drank of the water of life that God and Christ give. So the river will be literal, and it will also be a symbol of the life that flows out of it from God and Christ. It will be actually a constant reminder to us that Jesus Christ is the living water who gives us life. Did you know He's the one that quenches our thirst for life? What? Have you ever been... Have, do you remember before you were saved? Some of you probably saved at a very young age, but some of you were older when you got saved. But you know what? You had a hunger to thirst for something that you lacked. Right. But boy, when you got saved, your thirst for life got quenched. Right. Amen. And Jesus is the one that quenches our thirst for life. And by the way, He satisfies our thirst for life. He fulfills our thirst for life. And He completes our thirst for life. Look at verse number 2. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nation. It's a very interesting verse. Remember, the tree of life was also planted in the Garden of Eden. I believe it's the same kind of tree, if not the tree. And by the way, it'll be planted on both sides of the river. And I believe there'll be multiple trees that will be the tree of life. Amen? Um, notice in Genesis chapter number 2, verse 8, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man who He had formed out of the ground, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, a tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Bible doesn't say anything about that tree being there. Thank God. I don't think we'll need that tree there. Do you? I want you to notice a couple of things that are said about the tree of life. The tree of life actually bears 12 crops of fruit. And the Bible says one crop each month. You say, now, wait a minute, preacher. Isn't that a, a problem with the Bible? Because didn't you say last week that time would be no more? I certainly did. And that's a good question. It brings up a good thought. Well, time will be no more as we know it. But this is an expression, I believe, of joy to help us understand that the provision of God is going to be ample for us. There's going to be all this fruit and it's going to come around every so often. It's going to be producing and it's going to be available. It's going to be abundant. And there will be 12 different kinds of fruit at least on these trees. So I have no problem with it saying every month because it just helps us to understand in a way that our minds can understand it. By the way, it'd be hard for us to figure out how often it was going to bear if John had wrote in there and said, well, it's going to bear its fruit every five billion trillion years. You couldn't figure that out. And I couldn't either. So there was no way of knowing. So he put it down in a way that simply that we could understand that it's going to bear fruit and it's going to yield and it's going to be regular and it's going to be consistent. And I bet it'll be delicious as well, don't you? What's the 12, 12 fruit going to be? I have no idea. I don't know. I hope it'll be something I like. Amen. <laughs> and I bet it will be, don't you? Yeah. Amen. Could you imagine somebody walking up to the Lord and saying, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think you'll do that. I think you'll enjoy all of that. Amen? And I think I will too. But it symbolizes continuous fruit or continuous life. There is no time that the tree will not bear fruit. And by the way, it will always bear fruit. It provides eternal fruit forever. Therefore, the person that eats of the tree of life is nourished by its fruit eternally. He's going to live forever. And there is also another symbol here, of bearing the fruit of God's Spirit. The person that eats of this tree of life will bear the fruit of the Spirit eternally. And that's a very deep thought, one that we don't have time to really get into. <coughs> Notice in verse number 3. Uh-oh. Go back to verse number 2 for just a moment. The Bible says, and I, I've got to share this with you. Uh, it, it, notice in the last part of the verse, what does it say? Oh, where's, where's it at? 
I'm going the wrong way. Somebody help me. There it is. I had been, uh, probably about 20 years ago, I was working one day and I walked into this place of business and uh, I was a peanut man. I sold crackers and potato chips and different things. <laughs> had a great job and I was <coughs> preaching. And this guy knew that I was preaching. And I hadn't been preaching too awfully long at that time. Uh, maybe two or three years. And, and he knew that I was going to Bible college. And so he said, come here, I've got to ask you a question. And uh, I'd never read, he probably hadn't even read this verse before. And he said, in Revelation chapter number 22, verse number 2, there's a, there's a verse in there that really, I've got to have an answer for it, and you're the one giving me the answer. And so I said, well, lay it on me. He said, well, it says it talks about the leaves of the tree for, were for the healing of the nation. What does that mean? And I looked at him and I said, uh, mm, I have no idea. And I did. And you know what? That's an interesting question. Hesitantly, I said, uh, I, I, said I, I don't know. And then he looked at me and he said, and you're a preacher? <laughs> and I said, well, yeah. I said, God's called me. He said, well, you're supposed to know this stuff. Well, I said, well, brother, maybe I'll do a little study on it and I'll come back and talk to you about it. But you know what? 20 years later, I remember this question and I still feel I really don't understand the full implications of that statement because it's, it's a deep thing. Uh, the word for healing is in the Greek a word from which our English word therapeutic is derived. The word has its root meaning and has the idea of serving or ministering. So, I still don't know really any more than I did when I was a young green preacher. I'm still pretty green, amen. I'm just getting old, amen. I'm, I'm still green. Uh, so, but if you can share some light on that after class, I would love to hear it, amen. But for the healing of the nations. And that's what the Bible says. Now, let's go on. And let's move along to the throne of God. There it is. Verse 3. And there shall be no more curse. Boy, we could stop right there and shout a while, couldn't we? No more curse, ladies. No more curse. No more curse, men. Could you imagine? And But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. No more curse. Did you know the curse brought suffering in Genesis chapter 3? Sure did. It brought great suffering. Verses 3.16, Womans, And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And thy sor in thy sorrow shalt thou bring forth children. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Verse 17, To Adam, God said, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, say, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. The curse brought suffering. It's exactly what it brought. But you know what else it brought? It brought death. It brought separation. Can you imagine? We just heard the word just a few moments ago that one of our members, his father, just passed away this evening, just a while ago. And I was down at the hospital today to see his dad. His dad was unconscious, and I didn't get to witness to him. And I don't know his soul. I don't know where he's at. But I do know one thing. He's not in his body anymore. Right. He's not in this world anymore. He's not just dead, but he's in eternity in one or two places. He's either in heaven or he's in a devil's hell. I do know that. And I'm saying tonight, the curse separates. It separates. It separates those that are wicked, and it separates the saints as well. You know what? There's a separation between us and the loved ones. Think about the people that have left our church, just our church in particular. We've had a lot of deaths in the last year. And the people that I love, and it's brought a separation. Why is that? It's because of the curse. But thank God there's one good thing about the curse. It did bring something wonderful. The curse brought the Christ. Amen. Brought the sacrifice. For you see, had it not been for the curse, Genesis 3.15, the Bible says, and I will put enmity 
between thy, thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. He said this in verse 3, I delivered unto you, first of all, how the, all that I, which I had received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scripture. The hardships and the heartaches caused by the curse. But in the new paradise, there will be no more curse. During the curse, man has not been permitted to come before the throne of God. God's throne has been removed from the earth. But now it's where man is again. God's servants, the redeemed, will serve Him and heaven will be a place of enjoyable service. I like that, don't you? There's going to be a time in heaven. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we get home? Can you imagine what it's going to be like when you get over there and you really see that street of gold and you see that river that's the most beautiful river you've ever laid your eyes upon. And you see the, the shininess of the street. And you see those trees, especially that tree of life. And I believe the tree of life will be multiple trees. I believe it will be lined up on either side of the river. And I think it will be that way. But notice in verse number 4. The Lord's servants, and they shall see His face, and His name shall be in His foreheads. I like that, don't you? Think about it this way. Have you ever seen the Lord? One day you're going to. Can you imagine the first glimpse of heaven? I don't know about you, but most of you probably flew on an airplane. Have you not? Um, I don't particularly like Charlotte, North Carolina. And after last night's council meeting, or not before last, whatever it was, mm -hmm. the city council, I, I like it even less. I think they're just asking for trouble. And uh, uh, they're allowing... Uh, transgender people to go to either restroom they want to go in. And that's just opening up the door for all kinds of trouble. Because not only transgender will say they're transgender, but uh, perverts <coughs> will say they're transgender. Right. Um, child molesters would say they're transgender to go into these different restrooms. I'm going to be honest with you. If I had a child in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I lived there, I'd move. Yeah. I really yeah. would. I would move. But uh, I do remember, I was the first time I was in India, and Brother Arvel had stayed over there for three weeks. Three weeks is a long, long time for a country boy to be away from mama and country cooking. I'm just telling you. And I remember, Brother Tony, how I felt when we flew back in to New York City. I don't like New York too well. And uh, we flew into New York, and I was glad, Brother Rodney. But I'll be honest with you. When that plane sat down at the Charlotte Douglas International Airport, I think I could have been like the Pope, got down and kissed the ground. Because I was glad to be back in North Carolina. But I'm going to tell you, as we were flying, and it was just in the evening time, and had a just perfect view of the city. And the first glimpse of that city made my heart skip because I knew not so much for that city but there was somebody going to meet me there. See, there was somebody to meet me at that airport terminal. And as that plane landed, and I, my heart began to race a little bit more because I knew that I was going to see somebody that loved me and that I loved. And uh, at three weeks, but can you imagine? Can you imagine what it's going to be like, Miss Connie, when you get that first glimpse of glory? Now, I don't know how to be. I, I've been with people when they die. Brother Ken, I've been with folks that were seeing over on the other side. You say, are you sure? But from their own testimony, they were seeing over on the other side. Wow. I saw some other, been with some other people, didn't say a word. And I don't know what they were seeing or, or, or if they did until they got there, until they passed away. But I'm telling you, I've been with people and I've seen them and I've heard them talk about what they're seeing in the sight. And they can't describe it. They can't describe it. Could you imagine what it's going to be like? Could you imagine the thrill when you see heaven? The first glimpse of it. Could you imagine? I mean, you're there. Could you imagine? Can you imagine what it's going to be? But the Bible says, and they shall see His face. Amen. I've been looking for Him. And I'm looking for Him now. One of these days you're going to see Him. 
I believe He's coming in the clouds of glory. I believe He's going to take His church. I believe we're going home. Amen. Amen. But it could be that I'm going to go by death. <coughs> you may go by death. But I want to tell you something. One day we're going to see Him. We're going to Amen. see Him personally. We're going to see the Lord. And boy, that's something to get excited about. Amen. They shall see His face. But not only that, but His name shall be in their foreheads. This is the name of God written in the foreheads of believers. You say, preacher, what is this? Well, I don't know exactly what it is. It's one of those things I cannot tell you. I'll just, I do know what it is. It's His name in their forehead. <laughs> is it a stamp? I don't know. Is it a tattoo? I don't know. It's His name in the forehead. Amen. And let me just say, it, it's going to be all right. Amen. It's not going to, it's not going to mess you look so. Amen. You're going to be perfect. Amen. Amen. It's God's stamp of approval. I don't know what it will look like. could be a jewel. Who knows? But I want to tell you, His name is going to be stamped and He's going to be placed in their foreheads. I like that. And it simply means this. We are going to belong to God. Amen. <laughs> We're going to belong to God. Well, we already belong to Him. Amen. Yeah, I know. But He's going to say, come here, youngins. Amen. And you know what? He longs for that. Can I tell you this? This morning I went and picked up my granddaughter. Me and her had the best time up on the mountain. And I was going to take her to the babysitter for Dana. And this is relevant. You'll get this in a while. And uh, after we watched uh, Winnie the Pooh. And I know Winnie the Pooh backwards and forwards and everything. I know all the scenes, the deleted scenes and all that stuff. Too. And... Uh, Know, know every character really well. I can almost quote it word for word. And we watched little Minnie the Pooh and we got in the car and we made our way and I took her to the babysitter and uh, she took her shoes off and I was fussed at her for that. And we got out and we made our way and got in the house and I gave her over to the, to the babysitter, her aunt, to put her luggage <coughs> in and she has her food bag and her diaper bag and, and I start back out to the car. And I kind of look back at the door. And I see a little girl standing there looking. Mm. And I look back and I go, bye. And I get in the car and I sit down and I just, for some reason, I looked over there again. And there's a little girl standing there doing this. <laughs> I put it in reverse. And I backed up the drive. And I was looking at the door. She's doing, had this little sad look on her little face. I mean that same one you seen the picture of earlier. And I backed out and put it in drive. And I looked. And I stopped. And I almost wept. Because she didn't want me to leave. Without her. See, she wanted to go with me. Right. She wanted to be with me. Because I'm her pop pop. Yeah. <laughs> and I got to thinking about that. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> There's somebody that loves yeah, us more man. than that little girl loves Pop Pop. <laughs> There's somebody that loves you and I more <laughs> than I love that little girl. Yeah. And there's somebody longing for you and longing for me. Yeah. He wants us. Oh, honey, I want to tell you, glory. I'm telling you one of these days, hell, we're going to be yeah. with Him. And it's going to be sweet. And it's going to yeah. be wonderful. There'll be no separation. Oh, yeah. God's not going to get in the car and back out and just stand there at the door that's waving that's and, and saying, Lord, I want to be yeah, with you. Right. Because the Bible says that so shall we ever be with the Lord. I tell you tonight, yeah. glory to the Lamb of yeah. God. One day we're going to see His face. We're going to behold the King of glory. Yeah. And I say hallelujah oh. to the Lamb of God. Yes, amen. <laughs> I'm about to run. Amen. She wanted to be with me. She just wanted to be with me. And I'll be honest with you. If she does that very much, she'll be with me. <laughs> she'll be going to the hospital like her mama don't want her to. She already visits with me to the elderly. Yeah. Amen. Listen. I want to be with him, don't you? Yeah. yeah. I got a couple more things to share with you. God, <laughs> verse number 6, 
Is that where we're at? Uh, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Let's get on with it. There shall be no more night there. Yes. I don't, I don't particularly like night time, do you? No. Things go bump in the dark. Rodney gave me a flashlight for Christmas. One of them flashlights put your eyes out, brother. <laughs> you break in my house, I'm going to shine a light in your eye. It's going to blind you, and then you won't see what's coming. <laughs> Amen. It'll be Darlene like this. Woo! <laughs> There shall be no night there. It's going to be a beautiful place. I believe on the new heaven and the new earth, there'll be no more darkness. There'll be no more night. It'll be completely daylight all the time. You won't need to sleep. You won't get tired. You won't have any struggle. You won't have a, a yawn. You ever get tired? Man, I get tired. 11.30 came last night and I was texting with somebody and from Guyana, South America, we was texting about 11.30 last night. I was still up, and the alarm clock come on 4.30 this morning. I said, Lord, please. <laughs> and I got up. Didn't want to. But there's coming a day, I don't believe we'll have to worry about that. Right. Amen. No more night there. And they need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them the light, and they shall reign for what? Yeah. Ever and ever. Verse number 6. And He said unto me, These things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent His angel to show unto His servants the things which must shortly be done. God reminds us that His sayings are reliable and true. The word shortly also means surely. The things are surely to come to pass. Then He says this, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy of this book. Blessed means happy. Jesus is going to come. Do you believe that? Amen. The signs of the time are everywhere. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And by the way, that's seven years after the rapture. And as it was also in the days of Lot. And what happened in the days of Lot? What was the big thing in the days of Lot? It was sin and it was in the sexual nature. Perversion, a lot of perversion. So we're seeing that today. It's a sign of the time. I'm telling you, Jesus is coming quickly. And he, blessed is He that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. I want to tell you something tonight. We need to guard. And that's really what keepeth means. It means to guard. And by the way, these things are a great treasure. They should be a treasure to the redeemed. Amen. We should teach them to others. And what you've learned, if you've learned anything in this class about the coming things that's coming to this world, the locusts. You remember the lesson on the locusts? That terrorizes me to think there's demons. 200 million that's going to come up out of the pit. And they're going to they'll be the size of a horse. And they're coming to planet earth. There's going to be death and destruction. The, the earth is going to be ravaged with famine. The animal's kingdom is going to turn against me. I'm telling you, we need to tell people that what's coming is not what you think. Right. It's going to be a time that's never been upon planet earth. And we need to warn people. And we, we do need to teach them. Right. What a shame. So many won't study the book and accept what it says. Very, very few people teach and preach out of Revelation. Verse number 8, I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down and worshipped before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. So first thing that John did, he fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. Now, he fell down. Interesting thought. Verse number 9, he said, <coughs> Then saith he unto me, See, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. It's interesting. He was warned not to worship the angel because he was a fellow servant. The angel goes ahead and says, Of thy brethren, the prophets, and of them which keeps the sayings of this book. And here's the kicker to it. There's no one in heaven to worship other than God. Amen. We should get a hold of that. Right. I've been to too many places and seen too many things. And I tell you, preachers should not be worshipped. They should be respected. A good godly preacher should be respected and honored. The Bible talks about double honor. 
Every God called man should be a man of honor. We should honor the preachers. We should honor those that labor in the Word and pray. We should honor those that God uses in mighty ways. But we should never worship them. And I'm sorry to say, some preachers have obtained worship almost status. So it's sad. It really is. <coughs> Verse number 10. And He saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Boy, the time is almost at hand. <laughs> he said, seal not. Seal means don't keep these prophecies from others. The reason that we are not is because the time is at hand. Jesus could come at any moment. And by the way, I believe He is coming. Verse number 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. This verse means that whatsoever a person is at this time, this is the way they're going to be forever. They're not going to change. Right. The Irvin, those in hell are going to be unholy. They're going to suffer the torments. The unrighteous are going to burn in the lake of fire forever. Those who are holy, those that are righteous, will remain so forever. We should thank God for that. Amen. The righteous will be righteous forever. The Bible says in verse number 11, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to every man according as his work shall be. And boy, that should be an eye-opener for us all. When Jesus comes, everyone will be righteously rewarded. And you'll be rewarded correctly too for what you've done. He says, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I'm just going to kind of skim over the rest of the top of this. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last. Jesus was and is before all things and will be king when all things are fixed in eternity. Somebody shout. Amen. Verse number 14, Blessed are they that do His commandments that they might have the right of the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. Do His commandments. No one will be saved nor enter the new paradise unless they put their faith in Christ and be born again. His shed blood is the only way to enter, thereby being washed in His blood. And the book of Romans teaches us that. Verse number 17, I'm going to skip some of this. Now I'm going to go back to verse number 16 for just a moment. I want you to notice verse 16. Don't be afraid to teach the book of Revelation. Jesus said, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you. These things. Notice this. What does he say? In what? In the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bride and morning star. God wants this book studied, according to Scripture, in the church. And we need to study this book. Yet many churches won't and don't study. He's the root and offspring of David. And as the root of David, he was before David, and all things were made by him. So we know that. Now the final invitation. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that hears say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. What an invitation. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of this prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. What's well, a very serious verse there? Let me give you a couple of thoughts. It's a solemn warning. Modernists and infidels should take note of this grave person, uh, grave warning. A person who is really saved will not tamper with the Word of God. Are you listening to me? A person who is really saved will not tamper with the Word of God to the point of this. You say, why? Because if they did, God would take a saved person and kill them. And put them in the lake. I don't believe that He will do that. I believe that... You say, well, how could... What would keep a saved person from doing that? Well, if the Holy Spirit of God lives within you. You see, what I believe would happen to that person, I believe it would be a sin. 
And I also believe it would be a sin unto death if they made their mind up that they were going to do that. I believe God would kill them before He would allow them to tamper with His Word. And I'm telling you, it's a serious thing to mess with the Word of God. The Word of God is forever settled in heaven. This book of prophecy is what it is. Don't change it. Don't even think about changing it. It's a grave sin. But it does not mean that saved people can be lost once they're saved. Because once saved, I believe, always saved. Anyone who changes the words of the prophecy of this book will be lost forever. Verse number, and I'm closing right now, verse 20. He which testifieth these things, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, even so, come, Lord Jesus. You know what? That would be a, a real good Bible verse to memorize. Surely I come quickly. Do you believe He's coming? Amen. Well, how would we reply to that? Would we say, Amen? Amen, Lord. Let it be so. Let it be so. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. You know what John was saying? He said, it's okay if it's right now with me. Come on. Is that the way you feel about it? Amen. It's the way I feel. But then I think about the lost people that I know. And I say, Lord, Lord, give me another day. But even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The book of the Revelation. The book of Revelation has unveiled to us the Lord Jesus Christ. And He says in the closing words, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Again, class, this has been one of the greatest blessings in my life to study through this wonderful book. I hope that you've gleaned. I hope you've learned some things. And if you come back in four years, we'll do it again. Amen. May the Lord bless you tonight is our prayer. Let's pray together. Father, Lord, we sure love you this evening. Lord, we don't know how to thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you, God, for every truth that is contained in the word. And Lord, there are many, multiple things that we don't understand, especially about the prophecies that are held in this book. But Lord, I do realize one thing. Lord, my job is not to change the Word, but just to preach that which You've given unto me. Lord, to, to, to expound on it. Lord, in the way that would be pleasing to You. Lord, I don't know anything else tonight but just to tell You, Father, how much we love You. We want to thank You for all that You're going to do for us. Lord, we thank You for all that You've already done. <coughs> Lord, You've been so good. But Lord, we don't even have the conception of what You have waiting on us. Lord, heaven will be worth it all. And Lord, we pray tonight that You would help us. And Lord, we pray tonight we'd be used to bring others into the fold. We ask these things tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.